yeah, I think when in doubt, if you don't know what's important, the thing that you least want to do is usually going to be the one initiative. Right. And uh, this morning was a good example, actually. So it's just like this one gnarly project and it involves a lot of paperwork and legal stuff. And I was just like, Dah. and uh, what I find is I give myself just a little like Scooby snack first thing. So I have one or two things typically in the morning before I get into that most gnarly task that are, they're fun items. So for instance, I'm trying to uh, learn a new type of drum. And so I just took two minutes to set up a lesson for that drumming session. And I was like, okay, Scooby Snack, now I need to go into the salt mines to deal with this project. I like to just get a small piece of paper about that big or a small index card folded over so that I have a finite amount of space. And so I really try to narrow it down to one or two key things per day that I'm gonna focus on. And usually my day is split. I try to make the first half of my day the creative uh, maker portion up until lunch. And then after that, I can do kind of the half hour calls, the hour long meetings and so on for, for management. And uh, I have a journaling practice. So I have a, a journal it's called the five minute journal. So I do uh, a few minutes in the morning uh, and then a few minutes at night uh, just before bed to review the day. So I spec out say the two or three uh, key objectives, the two or three key attributes that I want to exemplify for that day. Whether it's, I, you know, one that I write down a lot is unrushed, just feeling unrushed. It can still be quick, but there's a difference between being quick and feeling rushed. And then doing a sort of a post-game analysis each night. It only takes a couple of minutes. So I do that pretty much every day. I'd say that's, that's definitely one of my rituals. My, my general morning routine, wake up, yeah, ideally that's somewhere between uh, 6.30 and 7.30. Meditate first thing for 15 to 20 minutes, usually just repeating a sound or a word. Then brew tea, sit down, turn on music, do the five minute journal, exercise if I have the time blocked out that morning. Then get into the creative stuff uh, up until lunch, which is usually going to be some type of writing, podcast related, whatever that might be, some type of creative synthesis, and then on I go. But the Scooby Snacks are laid out right up front. Uh, quick tips, number one, you know, protect the asset. You have to have an exercise practice, but really focusing on mobility. The second thing is you're the average of the person or the people you associate with most. And a good trick is volunteer for organizations. So what I did to build a network here in Silicon Valley was uh, volunteered for business organizations that brought in incredible speakers. Volunteer, do an incredible job, never be late, always be early, kind of Marine style and ask for additional responsibility because volunteers usually think they don't have to perform well because they're not getting paid. So be the opposite of that. And I got to the point within a few months where I knew no one, I was just fresh out of college, and uh, then I got to produce an event. So I got to reach out to all the speakers I wanted to develop personal relationships with. And it was uh, a really straightforward shortcut to developing a really great network. Closely related to that, uh, people ask me like, what's the next hot industry? And what I always say is, don't worry about that. Find any company that's say 10 to 30 people and growing really quickly. Doesn't matter what the industry is, but if you can get a job working directly for the deal makers, whoever those people are, you know, the CEO, CEO, director of business development, whatever, if you can observe master deal makers in a fast growing company, take that job. What you learn very quickly when you observe deal makers is that you're not looking for the answers to life. You're looking for the best questions. If you have the wrong questions, it doesn't matter what answer you get. So when you observe a really good deal maker and you observe how they phrase questions, how they overcome objections, how they find compromises or win-win situations that are a lateral step you never would have thought of in a million years, uh, they do it by asking better questions. And you'll notice questions uh, that show up again and again and again. And you can take those and borrow those, put them in your toolkit, and they'll serve you for life, you know? <laughs> Biggest challenges, as far as I can tell, most of them come down to maintaining focus. It's, it's easy to discard, say, 10 terrible ideas and go after the one good idea. But when you start to get a little bit of momentum, uh, you can drown yourself in good opportunities that aren't great opportunities. And if you scatter your focus, you try to do 17 different product lines, you can kill your business really easily, uh, particularly when you have a small team. So I think uh, asking yourself repeatedly, what is the one project, the one initiative, the one campaign that if successful, will render the rest of these things either unnecessary or much, much easier? What is that, what is that one step? Uh, it returns back to measurement. So how are we, 
defining success. Like if we want to grow the company, let's just say, what does that mean? In three months, six months, what are we measuring? Why are we measuring those things? And uh, you know, what is a sort of uh, a, a comfort goal? Meaning like, okay, we think we can easily hit this number. What is a stretch and what is like, hallelujah, we, we threaded sure. the needle. And once you have that number, then you can look at those five and say, all right, which of those are going to serve us right now? So I have to continually ask that type of question. This stuff isn't financial for me. I mean, if I wanted to do financial stuff, I'd be doing straight angel investing 100% and I would be doing, you know, monetizing my audience in a number of different ways. Uh, but I have enough. I mean, uh, money's nice. More is always better than, than less, I suppose. Everything being equal. But I don't think everything is equal. Uh, once the finance becomes the sole goal past a certain point, there are costs, there are sacrifices. Uh, oftentimes. So, so for me, uh, enough creatively, I don't think I'll ever have enough. Um, but financially, you know, I still drive the same broken down 2004 used Volkswagen Golf that I've had <laughs> since good. then. That's a good sign. So, uh, low burn lifestyle as opposed to infinitely ever more money, I think gives you an incredible amount of leverage because you know that even in the worst case scenario, you're covered. You're covered. Yeah.